while selecting judges to the superior judiciary because Justice Chalameshwar was actively involved and identified with a political party before he became a judge and therefore he has a certain respect for the political class. Your political past doesn't mean you are going to side with your party but your political past does give you a certain respect for the political process. And I think Justice Chalameshwar hit the nail on the head when he said, when he accepted the Attorney General's argument that what is part of the basic structure is not primacy of the judiciary but non-primacy of the executive. When Article 124 said, President shall appoint in consultation what was basic to that was non-primacy of the president, not primacy of the judiciary and therefore I think it is a significant judgment and I think of all the five judgments, I think it is the most intellectually rigorous. <clears throat> it is the most intellectually rigorous of the five judgments. Now then coming to the first question of Jainas and then coming back again. Eminent persons. It was such an easy way to strike down a constitution amendment by saying there are no guidelines for eminent persons. So absurd examples were bandied around in those days. It can be Lata Mangeshkar, it can be Sunil Gavaskar, it can be Sachin Tendulkar. Surely the very context in which this provision is made and the fact that the appointment of the eminent persons itself was to be created, uh, was to be done by a constitutionally sanctioned collegium this time of Prime Minister, leader of the opposition or leader of the largest opposition party and the Chief Justice of India, surely that itself would have ensured that no such ridiculous appointment would have been made. It could have only been made of a person conversant, familiar with law, justice public affairs and public administration. Let's be clear, I am mentioning these last two deliberately because one easy way of reading out would be connected with law and justice which means you just appoint two retired chief justices, <laughs> two retired judges, <laughs> two eminent lawyers, two former attorneys general. No, it couldn't have been just the legal fraternity. It had to include people connected, involved in public life. Now your second question, Jenna, was that even the act does not create conditions for diversity. I don't agree with you there. When the amendment and the act provided for involvement of both the civil society and the political class and specifically provided that one member of civil society would be from the specified sections of society who needed to be in the judiciary for the sake of a diverse judiciary, I think diversity was fully taken care of by the Act but was not even thought of by the judiciary in this judgment. Then one of the questions from the gentleman at the back was, here was 
a distrust which started from the 70s and then through the 80s because of the personalities of particular law ministers etc it is this distrust which has carried through could this have been addressed somewhat differently now i don't see how the government and let me make this also very clear that i am no fan of this government and i have said this before on other public fora that we have to address this issue from the point of view of constitutional law constitutional theory and political theory not be blinkered by our like or dislike for this particular government there is no way no other way in which the political class could have won the trust of the judiciary but by saying that three out of six will be judges i don't think the political class could have done anything more but here the judiciary should have been more trusting the judiciary should have been more trusting should have had a more charitable view of the evolution of our society of our civil society a more charitable view of the responsibility the sense of responsibility of the political class and the judiciary should have given this system <coughs> the new system a chance to work and the last question was <coughs> how much more i think in matters concerning the judiciary there is now going to be a certain hypersensitivity and many things maybe judges salaries maybe service conditions maybe perks maybe you know <laughs> ltc all this could be related to judicial independence they will definitely the judiciary i think will definitely to uh, continue to apply stricter standards when other constitutional amendments are challenged but anything concerning the judiciary is now going to run into rough weather so given that the court has now posted the matter for consideration of uh, views on how the collegium could be reformed what what would be best case for you in terms of uh, reform do you see paths for civil society and the executive to have a say in the supplementary judgment that's going to come out do you see that uh, either rti or transparency or some kind of norms uh, that potential candidates must meet would that in your view uh, at least be a step forward from both the uh, collegium and uh, of course not njc in your view but the collegium yeah ask a supplementary question on that i i have serious doubt about whether this consequential hearing or whatever they're calling i mean under what jurisdiction are they what legal provision what constitutional provision because they are essentially becoming a parliament now and they have asked the government uh, to collect all views mm. uh, how is i mean isn't this a basic separation of power restriction should they stop at least now or i don't know i mean or is it 
the case that because they have said um, judiciary means judiciary and nobody else can say anything about judiciary. That's if you look at the power equation in the in the judgment. Apart from saying um, primacy of the judiciary, it means no involvement of anybody else. I think that's the at least in Justice Kerr's judgment, the overriding principle is nobody else can have anything to do with this now. Um, is that sort of uh, also giving them? I don't know. Maybe it's just this bench. Is it becoming? So arrogant that they believe they can go beyond the constitution. I know I'm using strong words, but I wanted to see what if somebody else has a view on that. Um, yeah, Arish, before taking the next yeah. question, and yes. then we'll answer all together. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to say that if I had been sitting there and if I had been asking this question to the speaker, I'd have phrased it slightly differently. My question would have been: Has Parliament shifted to court number four? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is Sudarshan and I am a visitor, visitor here in Bangalore. I normally live in Ahmedabad. Uh, thank you for a very, 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 very cogent discourse and uh, I hope Daksh records this and puts it on YouTube as it is done as an audio or a video. It's, if it's not a practice, it will be a good idea to do for more people to learn this, how this has been argued out as a case. As the case, maybe I am convinced after hearing you, yes, that this is a better way of perhaps doing it, but then we all start raising questions. We don't trust judges for whatever they are, saying that if you do the self-selection, there is a problem. If you introduce other stakeholders like a law minister, you are not very sure whether he is an eminent lawyer or a past jurist who has his own stake in future. And civil society is always questioned, so loose. What is a civil society? And civil society and you know the comments like saying that say, so civil society is not mature enough. But of course theoretically it can always be argued that civil society is the best in democracy because it creates a critique, fearless, independent and of a critique which is a must in any democratic society. The problem is that legislature itself, where we are putting so much faith that whether you can challenge the legislature, actually civil society does that to both the legislature and the executives. This has been the history of civil society. So it appears very good that civil society has a case. I mean, if it starts participating in this process, I see, and this is a comment, the problem is today, the crisis today in the institutional governance is not so much the structures and systems. Actually, we are trying to fight this out. We are trying to put one system against the other, one institute and, you know, reforms within the... This is the paradigm in which we work and we think that institutional solutions are the solutions. That's, that's, the, that's where we need to look. But I think we also need to look back at the individuals. The crisis is in the individual. And this is the, the clash is basically is the licentious liberty versus educated freedom. Because if you put individual in this framework, then the behavior of the individual has to change. And there is no way we are ensuring in any system, since I come from an educational institution, I feel more acutely about this, that we are not preparing the younger generation to educate themselves on how to use their freedom. And that is the crisis, that's at the crux of the crisis. So I think if we can also shift the paradigm a little, I am not saying, within the structure what you have argued out is the best, yeah, I am not arguing on that. But I think there is a larger question which we need not miss out and the paradigm has to be examined afresh. So yes. that is what is my submission because if we were self-selecting saying that our institution was found by Gandhi and therefore one of the trustees will become the vice chancellor, MHRD has a problem. And now MHRD wants to tell us that we are the sponsoring agency, write in a contract, then we will give you grant, otherwise we will not give you the grant. I think this is dangerous to the autonomy of an institution. So I would also consider why judges should not be left to themselves to choose the best. And if they don't perform, the accountability and transparency is theirs. The blame also has to be shared by them in some sense, if they self-select. When we were self-selecting, I am responsible for the whole institution and what Gandhi, Gandhian education system was. So, I mean, there is both way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you. 
So uh, my name is Nat Malupalai. I head up eGovernments Foundation. We work in the area of urban governance. A um, couple of comments. I'm a layman when it comes to these issues, so very enlightening. So the first thing that struck me was, is there a different solution? Does political class needs to find a way representing it in this collegium that you're talking about? Can it be just the eminent citizens? Will, will that have made a difference in how this turned out? First question. Second is, as we talk about democratic principles here, isn't one of the things the judiciary plays is to avoid the tyranny of the majority, right? So is, does democracy need to be a part and parcel of this concept that we are talking about, right? That would, some enlightenment there would be uh, helpful. Um, I think the uh, you know, other thing I can't help uh, thinking about is, uh, you know, the uh, question about institution and process as well. Uh, you know, I, I certainly believe that you know, this education individuals is absolutely important, but sometimes there's also herd behavior. So I completely could relate to the point about diversity and not this people like you uh, syndrome that you talked about. And how is the world doing? How does the UK or an American system, which is looked upon as a good system, uh, think? And the last question is, as much as we talk about this, which we all recognize important, I don't know if laymen... Uh, think this is a big issue for us to solve right now compared to the earlier problems that Dux is taking on about the judicial reforms and how, you know, battering it is as, as it relates to common people. I don't know if any of us think this is a big issue mm -hmm. and I would, would love to hear from your point saying, has it really caused problems for us? A lot of questions, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I am happy to be speaking third in a row for, on behalf of the civil society because I am a member of the civil society. I believe we the people that is representing the civil society, the basic structure, architecture, superstructure and the very foundation of the constitution. And the constitution provides for all India judicial service. Constitution provides for citizen engagement in most of the things including especially in view of the 73 and 74th amendment both in the rural and urban area, governments. And as Daksh just showed about the rural law project, we are oppressed and suppressed and by the judicial delays in the system, by the failure to get justice in time, etc., etc. So at this stage, what is the remedy for the civil society? How should we go about getting it? Is there a straw where because the matter is still under consideration, go for review and things like that. Or we should just sit back and wait for 10, 20 years, as you said. Because when the opportunity came, the other people, like the people sitting on the other side, they did not seize the opportunity and place before the bench all the mistakes which the collegium made. That was one of the points which was an opportunity to press home the advantage that was not done. Was it also in league or something like that, that that was not done? There are many questions, but where do we get the remedy as far as civil society is concerned? And especially if it has to become a mature society, how fast it can be brought about? Yes. So, first two questions about this fresh exercise. Yes, as a lawyer, I agree with Harish. What is the jurisdiction to do this? Mm -hmm. Secondly, the collegium was created by a much larger bench. Now on the one hand, the five judge bench, when it assembled on the 3rd of November, said, the oh, 3rd of November or 25th, first I think it was on the 25th before the, after the Dashara break and then again they assembled after the Diwali break. The 3rd was the first. Th On the one hand, they cautioned that there are no, there are going to be no wholesale changes, right? Which meant just a little tweaking here and there. But then, in subsequent hearings, 
they suddenly realized that people's participation was important. Otherwise, it was just going to be a clubby exercise between five judges and seven or eight eminent lawyers. Not even 50 lawyers in the courtroom, but the creamy layer of the lawyers. It was just going to be a nice exercise uh, discussion group. And then they were suddenly reminded that no, stakeholders should also be involved. And so they asked the government to um, put it up on the law ministry website. Suggestions have been invited which will be filtered by senior advocates. The gist of those suggestions will be presented. But having said no wholesale change, I don't see this bench giving any role whatsoever to civil society. I don't see them giving a larger role to the law minister either. A law minister represents both the legislature and the executive because of the main judgment proceeds on the basis that the very existence of the law minister, one out of six is a pollutant. Then what greater role can be given to the law minister here in this exercise without undermining their own judgment. So I don't see anything significant happening and I think this is ultimately a legislative exercise. It should now be left even if the executive doesn't want to bring in a fresh NJAC. It should now be for the executive to tweak the collegium and bring in more participation. There is one more point I forgot to make in my main address but I think I must touch upon it. These majority judgments proceed on the basis of denial. Because I can't believe that these judgments say that even at the present stage, in the present dispensation, the executive is a participative collaborator or a collaborative participant, I am forgetting which. Now how has it been a participant so far? You know, it's like this, when you apply for a job, you are interviewed by HR. But then you don't get the job until security clears you. The present role of the executive is only that of security in a large corporation. And that the Supreme Court wants us to believe is the role of collaborative participation. Now, institutional institution as against individuals who man the institution. The author of the Collegium Judgment, Justice Verma, himself had regrets about his judgment and he said the same thing that ultimately it's the individuals who man the system, who make the difference. And I think there can be no quarrel with that proposition. And so, if ultimately it boils down to who the individuals are, then all the more reason why in the selection of those individuals, there must be greater interface and interaction because self-selecting those individuals is likely to lead to significantly poorer choices 
than choices of individuals based on sunshine and other inputs coming in. Now, one of the questions was, I think it was from you, you asked two or three questions. Can the NJAC Act and the amendment, of course, the amendment and the Act again be brought in? Yes, it can be, provided there is political will, provided a two-thirds majority is assured again. I am not sure at all about that. Some changes can be made. For instance, eminent persons can now be defined. It is also possible to bring in a rule of majority because after all it is a six member body and this was a flaw which was pointed out. It could have been rectified by judicial creativity itself but they chose not to do it though they are creative in so many other aspects here they prefer to just strike it down. I think it would be useful to bring in the concept of a casting vote in a six member body and give that casting vote to the Chief Justice of India. And if that casting vote doesn't satisfy the requirement of primacy as the judges envisage it, then God help us. <laughs> then you asked a very pertinent question on the judiciary being the only bulwark against the tyranny of the majority. I fully agree with you. It, it is the judiciary which will protect the citizen against majoritarianism and against unconstitutional decisions which are forced through only because of a brute majority. But that does not mean that the selection of the judiciary must exclude the participation of the political class or civil society because then you are only trusting a class of robed brethren whose only qualification, a very important qualification of course, is their law degree and their learning. But that is not enough for the working of a constitution. Then there was a question on whether is this really a matter where the layman is concerned? It's not something judicial appointments doesn't affect the lay person in the way in which pendency of cases in courts affects him. Well, I think it affects the layman as much as pendency of cases does or bribery in a police station does because ultimately the quality of justice depends on the quality of judicial appointments. And if a layman, I'm just giving one extreme example, it's not the everyday layman. If the layman is going to be prosecuted for being gay because section 377 is held to be constitutional, then the layman should be concerned about how judges are selected to the higher judiciary and 
what can civil society do i think civil society can activate the political class can keep up the effort not allow the political class to surrender in the way in which they have done in the past to convince the political class that this affects the working of the constitution and the quality of the justice of justice i think civil society has an important role in keeping the debate alive and before you come to the next round of questions i remember one more thing sorry <laughs> is one observation in justice lokor's judgment i think the learned judge had not thought it through he said the present political dispensation is unlikely to agree to the appointment of a gay judge now who is it that declared homosexuality <laughs> to be illegal it is the judiciary <laughs> and therefore if the political class is objecting to a homosexual becoming a judge it is only doing its duty it is making sure that a person with criminal propensities is not placed on the bench <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think uh, four questions can i I I am a trained sociologist and a practicing scholar.